Alright, so before I get started with this actual thing, I just want to talk about something completely different. Uh, Imagine by John Lennon, now that I think about it, is probably the most pretentious song that I have ever heard in my entire life. Uh, back when the celebrities did that around March, April, or whatever, this whole thing first started. And you got a bunch of, uh, you got a bunch of famous rich people singing Imagine No Possessions when they're living in mansions. And then, at the, at the New Year's, uh, New York City celebration, Imagine was the last song that they played. And so you're singing to a nation of people who are dying, people who are sick, and people who have lost their jobs. You're singing a song to them that goes, imagine there's no heaven. Oh gee, that's consoling, that's comforting. But speaking of heaven, I wanted to talk about who makes heaven heaven. And I, I'm jumping around these seven signs of John based on some personal convictions at the moment. And so I just hope that this benefits anyone listening to this. And fun fact, there are only three stories in the entire Gospels that are mentioned in all four of them. That is the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus, the baptism of Jesus... And the feeding of the 5,000. Obviously, this is one is important. And that's just 5,000 men, not counting women and children, by the way. After this, Jesus crossed the Sea of Galilee, or Tiberias. When John was writing this, the Romans had changed the official name of it to the Sea of Tiberias. And a huge crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was performing on the sick. So Jesus went up a mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, a Jewish festival, was near. Therefore... When Jesus looked up and noticed a huge crowd coming toward him, he asked Philip, Where will we buy bread so these people can eat? He asked this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered, Two hundred denarii worth of bread wouldn't be enough for each of them to have a little. Alright, so he's asking Philip, that question to test him because there's at this point in the story there shouldn't have been any question about the divine resources that he has access to at this point and 200 denarii that's about six months worth of wages a denarii was considered a day's wage back in that time And Philip was thinking about this in terms of money and how much money it would take to carry God's work out in a small way. And unfortunately, that's what we tend to do ourselves. We tend to uh, limit God in the same way, looking for how God's work can be done in the smallest way. Sorry, in the smallest way. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? Then Jesus said, Have the people sit down. And barley, back in that time, was worth one-third the value of wheat in the East. And the fish were likely to be eaten as a relish along with the barley cakes. So basically, basically in that world, it would have been saying, Hey, you're bringing this cheap bread along with only these two fish. And 
and there wasn't much to work with, but Jesus is about to show that God doesn't need much. He doesn't need any help at all, but he often deliberately restrains his work until he has the participation of you and me. There was plenty of grass in that place, so they sat down. The men numbered 5,000, not counting the women and children with them. Then Jesus took the loaves, and after giving thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also with the fish, as much as they wanted. With what little he had, Christ was determined to give thanks to God the Father for what he did have. And a lot of all, everything in this, regarding the stresses of life, I think can really, if we're not careful, distract us from being determined to give thanks for the stuff that we do have. And this one also proves that little is much in the hands of Christ. And that really got me to get down on my, get down on my knees and pray like, Lord, all of mine is, all of mine is yours. I definitely know he is absolutely capable of making something beyond my wildest dreams or your wildest dreams or whatever we have little or big and bread uh, comes from grain which has the power of multiplication and reproduction within itself grain can multiply itself but when it's made into bread the grain is crushed making it quote unquote dead and no one ever multiplied wheat by by uh, planting flour. And the let spiritual meaning behind that is that Christ can bring life from death. He multiplied loaves of bread made from dead crushed grain and dead fish. And that crowd uh, that ate as much as they wanted... That crowd included that boy who brought the loaves and the fish in the first place. And, uh, you, know, and uh, you know, he definitely did not leave that scene empty-handed. He received a multitude himself. It just makes me want to bring more of my everything to him. When they were full, he told his disciples, collect the leftovers so that nothing is wasted. So they collected them and filled twelve baskets with uh, the pieces from the five barley loaves that were left over by uh, those who had eaten. Though the disciples did not understand or anticipate this miracle, Jesus invited them to participate in it, and without their work, no one would have been fed. Believer, God wants you and I to participate in His work, and it's a gift. And a privilege to do so.
and you know I'm st sometimes the mundane things of life make it hard to uh, You know, I'm. I went off on a tangent there for a second. Uh, he's basically giving a char. God is a giving character, and he wants to build the same character in us. And this references back to Proverbs eleven twenty four. There is one who scatters yet increases more, and there is one who withholds more than is right, but it leads to poverty. So I can personally attest uh, to this. It is okay to be, you know, what? Uh, th this part of the lesson might better be em might better em be emphasized later on in the chapter when I tie these two together. And he told them to collect the leftovers so that nothing is wasted. And Jesus is definitely generous, but he was never wasteful he wanted to make good use out of everything and as far as tying back into that proverb i can personally attest that there is nothing wrong with guarding what we have so that it's not wasted but that's not a reason for us to not do anything for anyone ever or to be too uh, stingy in heart And there were 12 baskets and 12 disciples, so there was a basket for each one. After the work was done, there was enough left over for each of them. Honestly, a lot of the pauses in this were me reflecting on 2020 and how disappointed I was in the year thinking like this was going to be the year that I took the next step forward in life as a man and all of that blew up in my face uh, because of the virus But, when it, but wherever you have an opportunity to serve, do it. And I'm talking about these signs in an attempt to get across the, uh, the character of Christ because he is the perfect spitting image of God and the perfect reflection of God's nature. And so I'm trying to use all of this to try to, like, get across uh, the nature of God. Especially in a time when a lot of people are trying to make their own God. When the people saw the sign he had done, they said, This really is the prophet who was coming to who was to come into the world. And they said this, uh, apparently because the way that he provided for a multitude in the open air environment that they were in, uh, reminded them of how God worked through Moses to feed Israel with manna when they were in the wilderness. Therefore, when Jesus knew that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. And king, in this sense, was a political title. Uh, the crowd was willing to support Jesus as long as he just gave them what they wanted and... Uh, and they were trying to use him to free themselves from Roman oppression. 
he knew he was going to be used as a political tool if he stayed there any longer. And he withdrew to pray because he was more interested in doing business with his heavenly father and than in hearing the applause of a crowd in earthly affairs. To Christ, the prospect of an earthly kingdom was nothing else than a temptation of the devil, and he rejected it. So all this, uh... I'm hoping that last particular portion kind of, uh, triggers some thoughts uh, regarding political hysteria that's going on in the country, uh, right now. Yes, Christians, I think, should be involved in politics. And yes, we should do... We should try to do our absolute best for the well-being of wherever we are in the world. But this world is not all there is.